Now we begin our study of fluids too. We start with Archimedes' principle. Archimedes was a Greek born on the island of Sicily in Syracuse in about 287 BC, likely the greatest physicist before Isaac Newton. His idea was this. Suppose you had a body of water and you immerse in that water a chunk, a block, or whatever of anything. Let's call this steel or copper or some metal for the moment. And let's just assume this is water, although it can be any fluid. This block has a volume. There is a buoyant force on the block pushing it up. You know this because when you get in a swimming pool and lift an object, you can lift that object quite easily that you could not lift if you were out of the water. So the water itself puts a buoyant force, exerts a buoyant force on the object. What's the magnitude of that buoyant force? Well, Archimedes looked at it, did some experiments, and he measured that the buoyant force was equal to the weight of the fluid displaced. So if you had a block that was a cubic meter in volume, the buoyant force on it would be the weight of a cubic meter of water. The weight of the fluid, not the weight of the block itself, but the weight of the fluid that it displaced. If this were a copper block and it had a volume of one cubic meter, it would have a density of 7,870 kilograms per that cubic meter. The volume of water it would displace would be one meter. The mass of a cubic meter of water is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. Outside the water, the block would push down with a force of mg, 7,870 kilograms per cubic meter times acceleration due to gravity. So for a cubic meter, the block would then weigh 77,000 newtons. The buoyant force pushing up would be the weight of the water displaced, which is mg, and we have a mass of 1,000 kilograms, so mg would equal 9,800 newtons. So the weight of the block outside the water would be 77,000 newtons, in the water, we would subtract almost 10,000 newtons and be on the order of 67,000 newtons. So it is much lighter in the water. And this is because of the buoyant force. Bernoulli's principle states that in a fluid, as the pressure decreases, the velocity increases. So let's look at that. Here's a pipe that's larger at one end. It has a large area here, A1 and a smaller area here, A2. Imagine that we took a slice and the fluid is flowing this way. A slice out of it right here. The volume of this would be some distance in this direction times the area. So the volume flow per second or some kind of measure of how much volume is flowing per second would be the velocity of 1 times the area of 1. The velocity is meters per second, so you have meters per second going this way and square meters in the area. Since the pipe must handle the flow, it comes in one end and goes out the other, that must be equal to the second velocity times its area. So this is called the continuity equation, that the velocity of 1 times the area of 1 is equal to the velocity of the area 2 times the area 2. 
And if you think about what that says, it simply says that the volume flow has to be the same. So that if I have a small piece of volume here with a large area, it fills up a larger portion of this. So for the same volume to go by in the same time, this has to go much faster. Thus, if the area is smaller, the velocity has to be factor, faster to equal the larger area times the smaller velocity. And this is called the continuity, continuity equation. So Bernoulli's equation actually says that the pressure at some point plus one-half times the density times the velocity squared plus rho g y, which will be the depth of the fluid, here y1, is equal to a constant. So if a fluid flows through this pipe, and this is area 1 with pressure 1, this is area 2 with pressure 2, then Bernoulli's equation would say P1 plus 1 half rho V squared plus rho GY1 is a constant, but it also has to be equal then to a constant at the other end. And so this then becomes the Bernoulli equation. It looks a lot like what we've done with kinetic and potential energy. Here, this looks a lot like the kinetic energy, one-half mv squared, where now, instead of the mass, we actually have the mass density. And this is the potential energy, rho gh, or rho gy. So it does look like we have kinetic plus potential energy. It, it is similar to that, but you see here now we've added a term in which we have a pressure term. So it's, it's not exactly the same, but it's a little easier to remember because it looks like kinetic plus potential energy plus this extra pressure term here. Let's now look at a problem in which we combine these ideas. Suppose we had a tank of water here at this height. Atmospheric pressure is pushing down on it. The pipe is open here. It's flowing out at a rate V2. The water level itself is dropping at a rate V1, and the pipe is open to the atmosphere, so the pressure out here is also atmospheric pressure. Writing Bernoulli's equation, we have P1 plus 1 half rho V1 squared plus rho G Y1 is equal to P2 plus 1 half rho V2 squared plus rho G Y2. Since it is atmospheric pressure at P1 and also atmospheric pressure at P2, these two terms will then cancel out. And we're left with 1 half rho V2 squared minus V1 squared is equal to we have the density on both sides of the equation so let's cancel out the density row and we're left with one half V2 squared minus V1 squared is equal to G times Y1 minus Y2. If we let the container be very large here and this orifice be small, the velocity here is really big. It comes really, it comes out. V here is very large. V2, V1 is very small. And so we then could ignore really the size of V2 in relation to V1 and we come out with one half V2 squared on this side since V1 is so much smaller subtracting it will make no difference whatsoever. That's going to be equal to G times the difference in these two numbers. Now Y2 is actually here so this is a negative number but 
remember y is negative in the first place because we're going down so this makes this a positive number here and let's just call that h h will be the difference between the initial height of the water and the orifice and so we wind up then with v2 is going to be equal to the square root of 2 times g times the height of the water as it began or the height above the, the spigot coming out just for some numbers if we let the height be 10 meters which would be about 30 feet g is 9.8 times 2 and take the square root of that then we would have the velocity coming out at around 14 meters per second and that's a little over 30 miles an hour so a 30-foot tank of water with an orifice here would be coming out at, at, at around 30 miles an hour. As a final note, we should say that this is non-viscous material. When we One final note, some comments about fluids that make them complicated. We have considered that we have a pipe and a liquid flowing through it, but we never considered the friction of that pipe along the edges as the water or the liquid flows through it. We never consider the frictional forces at the edges of the pipe. So we haven't done that. Second of all, there is something in fluids called viscosity. Viscosity is a measure of the fluid actually interacting with itself and the molecules dragging and pulling on each other. It's an internal friction of sorts. So therefore we haven't included the the friction with the outside of the, the pipe or whatever. We haven't included the viscosity of the fluid. And a final thing, there is something called turbulence. We have assumed that this liquid flows through here very uniformly, and that's called laminar flow. So while well, we've looked at several different topics, we've looked at laminar flow of a non-viscous fluid without friction at the surface.